Okie dokie. Oshinoko is a show that needs no introduction. Brought to us by the talent behind Lover's War and Scum's Wish, this anime broke the canon with only one episode, hitting the top of my anime list, Best Rated. Which is actually the second time an anime from Aka Akasaka has surpassed Full Male Alchemist, and in my heart, Mango Yokoyari is up there as well. As a fan of both mangaka, I've been following the manga since chapter 1 first came out, so finally having the anime here means I just have to talk about it. Starting at the prologue, which is basically its own movie, I'm sure we're all very familiar with what happened at this point. If you're not, I'm going to warn you, you probably should be. But we should all be familiar with the tragic loss of Hoshino Ai, being killed by a stalker sent by the father of her children, which ignites the revenge plot that this series centers around. Now, this is an episode that broke many people, myself included, and I wanted to go over two points that I think are very important to why our hearts were crushed so thoroughly during these last 20 minutes. The first comes with the story resetting our expectations. When we first start watching, we're introduced to Goro, a gynecologist and mega fan of Ai, who is tasked with delivering her baby after she comes to his clinic to hide a teen pregnancy. However, we also see him tragically killed by the same stalker that stabs Ai, which introduces the crazy premise of being reborn as the child of your celebrity crush, nepotism at its finest. Now, while being a great hook to draw in viewers, it also has the secondary objective of resetting your expectations by having a character die so early. Many people had assumed that the anime was now going to be this wholesome family slice of life that takes place in the entertainment industry following Ai and her children, the now reborn Goro as Aqua, along with his twin Ruby. Which, unfortunately, was not meant to be. No matter how much I wish it could have. We did have the fact that the stalker was still very much at large, we even see him during Ai's return from a break, but there's enough time between that moment and the last 20 minutes that are just filled with us getting closer to this unusual family, a teen idol mother looking after twins that are actually her reborn simps. If you consumed enough content, you probably had an inkling of what was going to happen, when you consider why this anime had an hour 22 minute first episode, along with already knowing that death is now a possibility in this story. But for a large majority of people, Ai's death came at a great shock, and it's thanks to Goro dying prior that we were able to mislead so many people. The second point is how we get to explore Ai's philosophy on love. When we first meet her, there's this weird dichotomy with her character. She's this super bubbly girl, overflowing with the charisma and charm you would expect from an idol, but the teen pregnancy is a stark contrast to the purity and innocence sold by people in her industry. Here we are introduced to the idea that If you aren't familiar with Japanese idols, they basically sell their fans on the idea of the perfect girl, always happy to see you, always wanting to put a smile on your face, never engaging in disgusting behaviour like dating or holding hands, which is obviously a bold-faced lie. This faultless being that can never exist, hundreds to thousands of people deluding themselves that this stage persona is a real person. It's almost sickening to hear about, but I, along with many others, love being able to bring smiles to everyone's faces, even if they have to lie about the happiness they themselves spread. It's perfectly natural to hide one or two children, when that's what the fans want you to do. And while it's a lie, it's a lie they wish to become true, with I wanting to turn that deceit into something genuine. As we learn more about her, we discover that I grew up in a children's home, previously only having a single mother who was arrested for theft. When her mother was eventually released from prison, instead of coming to pick up her daughter, she basically abandons I to live her own life. We see I state that she has no memory of being loved or loving someone else, which actually leads her to become an idol, trying to search for something that she can truly say she loves, with us finding out that she has yet to say those words to Aqua and Ruby, in fear of not knowing whether those words are a lie or not. It's something that I feel many people can connect to, struggling to be able to say they actually love someone, whether it's finding a partner or having no close friends or family to turn to. It's that instant connection between yourself and I that Oshinoko uses to draw us in and absolutely devastate us during her final moments, especially when we see I finally say the words that she has been holding back for so long. Ruby, Aqua, I still... 
よかったこの言葉は絶対嘘じゃない。Next arc, we have Aqua and the newly introduced Aramakana get cast in a live action adaptation of Sweet Today, which you might recognize from Love is War. You'll notice that the revenge plot actually gets put on the back burner in early Oshinoko arcs, as it's only really used as a driving force for Aqua to venture into different parts of show business. I've always seen this arc as just a really great setup for the characters of Aqua and Kana. Aqua after the time skip is mostly motivated by his pursuit for revenge, only really accepting the role to get close to someone from Ai's past, but he hasn't completely gone off the deep end yet, wanting to genuinely help Kana show off her acting skills in what was basically a doomed production. It's a key part of Aqua's character going forward, the son of a murderer who wants to dedicate himself to revenge, and the caring doctor that still looks out for everyone around him. These two parts of Aqua fluctuate quite often, as we see in a later scene where he states the line between Aqua and Goro blur the more he gets older. It's why he can pull out all the stops to protect the people he cares about, and then proceed to take advantage of them to further his goals. Basically, he has two wolves inside. Kana is initially seen as bratty and sharp-tongued, but we soon come to discover the internal struggle of a washed-off child actor, fueled only by the fire still inside her to push forward in the midst of constant ridicule and disappointment. It's very easy to understand why Kana is such a fan favorite, peaking at a young age and desperately trying to climb back up. Dogen Cobra included as that number one fan, as they absolutely go ham whenever they animate her. Just look at her Twitter, if only she could see how many people adore her. Next arc is Aqua joining the reality dating show Love Now, and I just have to say, this is still one of my favorite arcs from the manga. I know it's a basic bitch choice, but it's really this arc that really made me fall in love with Oshinoko. It plays with the idea of scripted reality shows so well, showing how the cast and production alike constantly play things up to draw in viewers. We get the innocent version where episode 6 opens up with Yuki Sumi professing that she wants to quit love now, upset that her classmates are bullying her because of guys she seems to gravitate towards, but we find out that it's all just a big exaggeration from both Yuki and the show to leave viewers off on a juicy cliffhanger. This opens up the idea of the vulnerability that comes with revealing parts of your true self or world to see, along with the production's willingness to fabricate truths to boost ratings. This innocent little scene played off as a joke eventually leads us to the not-so-innocent cancellation of Akane Kurokawa. From only a few harsh words and accidental scratch on the face, we see the production turn a minor argument into a full-blown war, encouraging the internet to relentlessly attack Akane online. I'm sure we're all familiar with cancel culture, people jumping on the bandwagon of who the next person there are allowed to hate, but we rarely get to see the point of view from the person being hated. How people ruthlessly scour through every nook and cranny of this person's life, looking for that new vulnerability to attack. How it destroys the psyche of those targeted, the culmination of hate from hundreds to thousands of people, driving someone to commit acts of desperation to escape the onslaught. If there was one episode I wish more people could watch, it would be episode 6 of Oshino Ko, in hopes that maybe a few more people will think twice before hurling insults and death threats at those they dislike. I will admit that there are some parts in the anime that I think the manga did better. The scene after Yuki and Akane hug it out, Aqua explains how while they may have made up, and we get to see all tweets from people attacking Akane. When it comes to the set pacing of the anime, it actually works against the scene here, as unless you're pausing every second, there's no way for you to actually take in each and every tweet we see, which kind of lessens the impact of them quite a bit. Compared to the manga, which we're able to read at our own pace, after Aqua's internal monologue, we just get hit with this gritty full page, the words the internet never forgives, surrounded by all these awful tweets made against Akane. We as readers slowly take in each and every bit of vitriol that the internet has to offer. It just packs so much more punch when you're able to read everything alongside Akane. 
However, I also have to backtrack here and praise the anime for completely making up for that with the sequence that comes later. We get to watch Akane through a montage of her entire life as an actor, seeing how hard she's worked to achieve the level of skill that she had cultivated, all while comments from the internet play over this, making assumption after assumption of how she's a lazy, self-centered, egotistical waste of space who only cares about messing with boys behind the scenes. It's such a difficult scene to sit through, enough to once again bring tears to my eyes and absolutely make up for any minor complaints I may have had before. The violin as well, I just love hearing it play during the climax of each episode. People love to talk about the opening, but Queen Bee's Mephisto just does something to me. It puts so many swirling emotions into my head. We get to see it play during a kind of suicide attempt, playing out with such dread during what could have been her final moments, only to get hit with that relief of Aqua pulling her back to safety as the violin rises. Then the end of the next episode, where Akane reveals her recreation of Ai's persona, paired with the amazing voice work of Manaka Iwami, being able to perfectly emulate the tone and cadence of Rei Takahashi, the voice of Ai, filling me with such ungodly levels of hype as we see her hair part like theater curtains to reveal the starry eyes of our long lost idol. Honestly, Mephisto's violin reminds me a lot of the to be continued ending from Jojo, the acoustic guitar of Roundabout creating similar feelings of anticipation and excitement, which is funny because it's become sort of a meme on the Japanese side of the internet, used in the exact same way Roundabout was for us. I haven't seen it spread to western meme culture, which is fair, but also a little bit sad. Season, the Idol concert which Ruby has been teasing since the very beginning. This actually explores a lot of Kana's character again, letting us peer into what she has been through over her career. Once called a genius child actor, we discover that the numerous roles she once had basically dried up as she got older, unable to find that same footing she once had. The people around her no longer looking at her with that same hope and expectations, being abandoned by both her agency and her parents. What we see here is a girl all alone in a cutthroat landscape, relying on only her strength of will to continue while everyone else has forgotten about her. A girl that simply wishes to be validated like before, to be told that she still has some worth, that someone still wants to see her perform just one more time. It's so beautiful to see Aqua become that beacon for her, that one thing she can hold on to as she once again tries to become a star. I also want to talk a little bit about the eyes as well, particularly this one thing that is only possible through the anime. We've all noticed the star eyes by now, it's kind of a staple of their character designs, but these eyes get so much love when it comes to showcasing their emotions. Maybe it's a gag like when Ruby is fangirling over Shirinai Frill, maybe characters who are awestruck have their eyes filled with galaxies, but it's the moments of Aqua's and Ruby's subtle changes that really get to me, either switching from white to black as a show of their cynicism, or shining ever so brighter during moments of true happiness. It's just not something you can do in the manga, and I love catching little moments like these. If there was one complaint I had for Oshina Ko, it would be that certain characters don't get enough spotlight, Ruby in particular I want to focus on. For all the arcs in Season 1, along with the next one that starts off Season 2, the only time we really get to see Ruby take center stage is the start of the show, the Peon episode, and during the first concert. You could even argue Kai is more of the focus in the latter two, which is really unfortunate as it's only until much later that she comes back as a main character. Other than that, she oftentimes sits in the background, to the point where people joke that Aka has forgotten Ruby even exists. Not to say she doesn't get anything at all, she's got that childlike wonder. We see her encourage Kana while she's down. She absolutely dazzles the audience with her passion reminiscent of her dear mother. But a lot of it is from the perspective of supporting Kana, which I just wish we had given her just a bit more focus. Oshinoko is often described as a cynical view of the entertainment industry, which to an extent is true. But I think what Oshinoko does with each arc is to not paint the industry as an environment that eats people alive but simply shine a light on the truth that, while being an entertainer is filled with constant hardship and setbacks, 
it's still a job that brings joy to so many people, celebrating those who have dedicated themselves to bringing us so much happiness. Thanks for watching. If you'd like me to be stabbed in the abdominal aorta, let me know in the comments below and tell me your thoughts while you're down there. Like and subscribe for more content. Let me know if there's something you'd like me to cover. I like to talk about anything that interests me. That's all I want to say. I hope you all have a good assured day.